Now what I want to do is I want to talk to you about the three strategies that will keep you, the secrets to building an optimistic mindset. You ready? Excellent. Here we go. Um, number one, the secret to an optimistic mindset. You got to be maniacal about your intake. Negativity in here means negativity in your body gets stored here and negativity comes out here. It becomes this loop of negativity. And so in order to build a positive mindset, I want you to be maniacal about positive input. That means really watch your news intake. Do not be watching it every day. Get the facts, get what you need to know from a trusted, measured, calm, factual source, and then turn that shit off, okay? That's number one. Number two, edit your social media. Anything on your social media feeds should be helping you be more resilient, more optimistic, more um, positive. Anything that you are following that triggers you, that is negative, that rubs you the wrong way. You know, one of the things that I've noticed I have some favorite celebrities that I have um, followed for a while because I think they're funny or I love um, just kind of their sense of humor. But there are so many people that I have muted right now because I think that what they're doing online is so freaking out of whack. Seeing people give us advice about quarantining from the back of their estates and mansions, telling us to donate when they're not saying they're donating, seeing this kind of tone deaf uh, celebrity thing going on. I'm normally not a negative person about that, but I have muted, muted, muted so many accounts because it's not doing anything for me. And you got to be selfish right now. You have got to edit your social media feeds so that your social media feeds are helping you build an optimistic and positive mindset. And so every day, the second I see someone at mute, 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 unfollow, 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 because negativity in means negativity gets stored here, means negativity goes out there from you. You want to put positivity, optimism, tools, strategies, things that keep you laughing, keep things that keep you giving you things that you can use right now. The second you start getting overloaded with Corona stuff, mute that stuff, edit, edit, edit your social media based on what you need. That's number one, maniacal about your intake. The second secret to building an optimistic mindset is do tiny things every day that boost your mood, okay? So we're gonna build your mood muscle. If you can, move your body because negativity gets stored here and moving your body, we know based on the research, simply moving your body for 10 or 20 minutes a day will release chemicals in your mind that help you boost your mood. The second thing that will boost your mood is I want you to make a tiny promise to yourself every day. Just one thing that makes you feel more positive. Is it getting up on time? Is it eating something healthy? Is it only having one glass of wine or reaching for a mocktail? I want you to put one tiny promise into place. Put it into the um, comments right now. What's one tiny promise that you can make to yourself that you're going to do every day? It might just be that you're going to wake up every day, take a deep breath, remind yourself that you're healthy, and that's going to be the tiny promise. I want you to do one tiny promise every day because keeping a promise to yourself will boost your mood and make you feel more in control. Another way to build your mood muscle is have a zero tolerance policy for your own negative thoughts. Right now, as you edit social media and edit your news take and edit your negativity coming in from the outside world, do not tolerate negativity from the inside world. I woke up this morning, I looked in the mirror, I looked at the gray hairs that are coming in, particularly like right up here and I started to go negative. I started to feel dreary and I went, Mel, cut this shit out. You got to fight to stay positive, gal. 
because we are in this for another couple months and do not succumb to despair. Do not start thinking negative stuff. When you have negativity internally, you got to have a zero tolerance policy for that shit. It's one thing to feel what you need to feel so that you can move through it. It's another thing to let negativity dwell up here and start ruminating. Five, the five second rule is genius for this. Count fucking backwards. The second that negative, five, four, three, two, one. Not listening to it. No, I am redirecting my thoughts. That's right. I am looking for the things I can control. I am keeping a positive attitude by focusing on things that I can control right now today. Got it? Good. The third thing that you need to do in order to build a optimistic mindset. You ready, everybody? Here we go. I want you to pick a small 10 week goal that you can control. Why am I saying 10 weeks? I'm gonna tell you why 10 weeks. Because I think that we've got 10 weeks ahead of us of physical distancing. I think we've got 10 weeks ahead of us if we do it right of life in this weird state. And I want you to pick one thing, one project, that's it, for the next 10 weeks, that's your personal project. It's something you can control. You ready? Something you can control. We're talking about how to build the skill of an optimistic mindset. And part of an optimistic mindset is focusing on what you can control. And I don't want you to jump ahead and worry about what's coming in the future. I want you to stay in this moment with me. I want you to realize that if you took on one small project for the next 10 weeks that you could control, something you've wanted to learn, some skill that you would love to have, some deficiency in your resume or your experience that you could gain in the next 10 weeks, there is something called YouTube University. That's right. Professor YouTube has so many tutorials out there. It's amazing. Right now, my husband is taking a Buddhist meditation teacher training class. My daughter is taking two classes. She is learning um, how to be better at Excel because she thinks it will help her with her summer internship. And it's something she was nervous about during the interview process. And she's also taking a painting class. What is one thing that if you were to use the next 10 weeks and we emerge from this and step into the next chapter of our lives and you have learned something or you have developed a skill that equips you to feel like you are better positioned to step into this next chapter, you will constantly wake up every day and say, today I get to take this class. Today I get to work on this thing. Today I get to spend an hour uh, polishing my Chinese, working on personal development. I see you. I see him, me mom, building a website. I see Sephora saying she's going to improve her English. I see uh, Nabil saying I'm going to develop editing and online skills. I see LDG, creative, healthy cooking. I see uh, Salio saying I'm going to find a class on YouTube University. What's a 10 week thing? Oh, I see Jack saying I'm going to take a French class. I'm going to learn how to crochet. I'm going to begin an online master's program. If you narrow your span of control to managing your mood, to being maniacal about the intake into your mind and working on a 10 week goal, you will be building an optimistic mindset because you will have weeded out negativity in from the outside world, which means negativity won't get stored here and it won't get expressed from you. You will have built your mood muscle by forcing yourself to move every day, by keeping a tiny promise to yourself and by being absolutely zero tolerance for your own negative bullshit on the inside. Five, four, three, two, one, redirect your mind to something you can control. And having a 10 week personal project where you pick something and you use YouTube University and you use this moment of time where you don't have anywhere to go and you don't have social distractions. You got time to focus on yourself these three things will help you build an optimistic mindset. Absolutely 
positively guaranteed. Um, can I require this of my teenagers? Um, here's what I would say about teenagers. One of the hardest things for teenagers right now is their loss of independence. And um, trying to require anything of your teenagers other than showing up for family dinner and creating their own routine, I think is a recipe for disaster. What I would do instead is I would share that this is what you're doing. And I would ask your teenagers a question. If you had a half an hour, an hour every day where you dedicated it to something um, other than school or other than being on your phone looking at social media, what's one thing that you never have time to do that you love doing? Is it playing guitar? Is it painting? Is it journaling? Is it reading a book? Is it knitting? Is it uh, working on your uh, tricks out on the trampoline in the backyard? What is it? If you ask your teenagers questions, in answering the question, they may find the self-motivation that this is something they want to do. I love that that uh, I don't know how to say your name. Jowl is is working on emotional dependency and uh, breaking apart the patterns that had you become somebody that was codependent and emotionally dependent on other people. Um, Dr. Caro, I love you very much too. Uh, I think that's it uh, today. The whole broadcast was about optimism. The reason why you cannot allow yourself to get into this pessimistic mindset loop because it keeps you feeling helpless, it keeps you feeling stuck, it keeps you overwhelmed and it makes you just stay stuck here and why you gotta build the skill of optimism. Because when you are optimistic, it's not that you are slapping a positive spin on a shitty situation, you are cultivating a mindset where you believe in your bones, your soul, every part of your being, that no matter what you're facing, you can have a positive impact on how you experience what you're facing because you can choose what you think about and you can choose how you respond. And when you start to develop an optimistic mindset, it creates more optimism. It helps you see solutions and opportunities. It makes you feel more in control. It gives you things that you can focus on. It begets the ability to feel empowered, which only creates more empowerment for you. And the three things that you can do to create an optimistic mindset is number one, here's the three secrets, be maniacal about what you allow into your mind. Totally, we do not turn the news on in this house. We don't allow it because you know the old saying, if it leads, it bleeds. There is nothing but negativity coming off of the news right now. So there are a few things that we check I look at the CDC, I look at the World Health Organization, and I look at the state of Massachusetts website, and that's about it. And I look at what Bill Gates is writing. And once I have the facts, I just focus on what I control, can control. I focus on my safety, that's it. I've also, every day I edit social media. Your social media should be serving you. If it triggers you in any way, if it creates any negativity, any ugh, uh, any tone deafness, any anything, mute it, unfollow, get rid of that shit. Social media should be a service that is supporting you right now in your efforts to stay positive, to stay empowered, to stay safe, and to stay laughing. That is what you should use it for right now. Uh, the second thing to do to build a positive mindset is build your mood muscle. Move your ass 10 to 20 minutes every day because your body stores negativity. Uh, make a tiny promise to yourself that you're gonna keep every day because keeping a small promise builds confidence, makes you feel like you're in control and it creates momentum. And zero tolerance for your own negative bullshit. You got it? It's one thing to feel feelings to move through them. It's another thing to let negativity sit up here and make you ruminate. Five, four, three, two, one. In five seconds flat, you feel your own negativity, you get that bullshit out of there. You got no room for that stuff right now. And finally, the third thing you can do to start to build an optimistic mindset, establish a 10 week personal project. This is something that you are excited to do that you usually don't have time to do. Why 10 weeks? Because I think that 10 weeks is gonna see you through this moment of time. Uh, use YouTube University to watch tutorials. Take small step every single day. And remember this little hack that I taught you. Thank you, Lorenzo in Italy. If you start feeling the stress and anxiety and panic of, I need to do this, I have to do this, blah, 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 blah. I can't get through my two list, I'm totally stressed out, blah, 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 blah. stop, 
take a deep breath, use these three words, I get to, I get to take an online class. I get to do my homework. I get to do this to-do list. I get to be home with my family. I get to have this time alone. I get to work on myself. I get to fight to be positive. I get to take 20 minutes every day and stream an exercise class. It will flip your mindset into one of optimism, of control, and gratitude. Because let's face it, if you're healthy right now, and if you're able to watch a video online, you have reason to be grateful. And when you remind yourself of that, you will feel positive. Um, somebody just asked me why Bill Gates. I'm going to answer real quick because he's one of the smartest human beings on the planet who has uh, made a commitment to donating almost his entire wealth to charities. And for the last decade, he and his wife have been at the forefront of uh, global health research and initiatives and taking action. And if there is a man who is informed, who has been studying this, he gave a TED talk in 2015 about pandemics, about world health, where he predicted this. He is talking about the fact that there are three things that we need to do right now. And one of them is we need uh, to all be uh, enforcing physical distancing for 10 weeks. We need to develop a way for everybody to test themselves so you know whether you've been exposed or not. And we need to collaborate go globally on a vaccine. All three things based in fact and research, all three things that are measured and calm, all three things that make a hell of a lot of sense that I get behind. And so that's one of the reasons why. Research, credibility, a decade worth of experience, the smartest people on the planet, and a measured factual delivery. That is what I respond to because I'll be damned if I allow fear, cynicism, uh, hysteria, any of that crap that you see all over the news and the internet right now to enter my mind. There is no reason for it. You have the facts. 10 weeks, keep yourself safe, keep your mind optimistic, stay connected with me, stay connected with your family and friends, and we will get through this a thousand percent. We will get through this together. I haven't lost anybody that I love. So I would not say what I'm about to say if somebody that I loved had died in this pandemic. But I have found the great pause that the last two months have forced me to take to be the greatest gift that I have received in the last decade. My kids have been home. I have been off the road. I have been forced to slow down. I have been reminded of what actually matters, your health, your family, your friends, what you're doing to take care of your mind and your body and your spirit, and making sure that you do something with the time that you have that you really, really enjoy. And the other thing that it's really made me stop and think about is making sure that I'm having fun, that my whole life isn't just work. And it's made me really start to think about the fact that I don't wanna go back to the life that I was living before the pandemic hit. How many of you feel that way? That this has been a gigantic mental perspective switch reset button that has boom, hit you really hard. I want to know in the comments, what is it that you, with this new perspective that the pandemic has given you, what is it that you want to change in your life coming out of this? I want to start seeing, I see people saying this has been a wake up call. I see people saying, yes, this has been a huge shift in my perspective. I see Brianna saying, I want to travel less for work. What do you want? Kelly says she's had a mental switch. Kelly, what has this pandemic given you in terms of the gift? Heather's saying, I want to ask myself, what do I really want to do? Kim says, I don't want to go back to the rat race. Brock says, I want to start the year uh, excited 
about it. Uh, I see somebody say, uh, Larissa says a new business. Uh, Megan says, I want more boundaries. Tara says, I want to have more fun. What is it that you want to change given the gift that this pandemic has given you in terms of shifting your perspective? Dinky says, value my friends and family. Uh, Jealous says, take care of my mental health. Spend more time with family. What do you want to change, everybody? Seriously. What do you want to change about your life? Is it a relationship? Is it that you have had the time to take care of yourself in small ways and that's giving you greater control in your life? Do you want to change your job coming out of this? Do you want to launch a business coming out of this? Do you want to um, change uh, your timeline for achieving your goals? Is there some project that you want to take on? Because what you're going to hear me say over and over again is that the single most, impro most important project you could ever work on is yourself. And the greatest gift that any challenge will ever give you is a perspective shift and the realization that you can face hard things, that you can survive hard things, and that in learning more deeply about yourself and about what you value through the challenges in life, you are going to be handed a moment where you can make a decision. You hear me say all the time, you're one decision away from a different life. Changing your life does not take motivation. Motivation is garbage. Changing your life takes discipline. The discipline to make a decision to change. You see, you need three things if you want to come out of this pandemic and truly change your life for the better. So many of you do not want to go back to the life that you were living. You see something greater for you. And what you're going to need in order to make that shift is you need clarity. You need the clarity to write the change down. And I want you to start right now. What in the comments? Let's get really clear. Terry wants to come out of this a healthier and better person. What is the clarity? Tell me the change that you want to make coming out of this. You've got to have the clarity to write it down. That's number one. The second thing that you got to have in order to make a change happen is you've got to learn the skill of confidence, which is the ability to try something when you don't feel ready. You may not know how to do this change. I see advocate for myself. I see more physical movement. I see I want to change my job. I want to start a business. I want to earn more money. I want to travel less. I want my work to have meaning. I want to get out of an abusive relationship. I want to help people in need. I want to make sure that I continue to keep the promises that I've been keeping, getting up on time, working out every day, working on my relationship. This is fantastic because you're having a moment of clarity. And when you start to write it down, you are starting to develop the confidence and the knowing that you deserve to have this change happen. And then finally, what do you need in order to really change your life? Because it's not motivation, everybody. It's discipline. Discipline to make small promises, keep small promises. Discipline to take small actions when you feel afraid. The discipline to find the courage to push yourself forward when you don't know how. That's how you change your life. Just those three things, clarity, confidence, courage. That's all you need. And that's why you got me in your life because I'm here to push you. I'm here to encourage you. And I love seeing what you want to change. That, oh, I see you need help building confidence. No problem. I got you covered. Because confidence isn't something that you feel. Confidence is a skill. Confidence is the willingness to try because it's through the act of trying, through the act of simply writing down what's the change that you want to make right there in the comments. 
just writing it down and trying it out, trying out writing what that feels like, that's going to show you that you have the ability to start to express the things that you want. And that's the first step to claim these things that you think about. Um, so for those of you, more than a hundred of you who have written to me in the last week and who have said, I've had a huge perspective shift thanks to this pandemic. And there are some major changes I wanna make in my life. I wanna start a women's group. I wanna end this relationship that I'm in. I want to stop bashing myself all the time. I want to launch that business I've been talking about. All of the things that you've put on hold, now is the time to change. So many of you asked me, is it the right time to change your job after a pandemic like this? Absolutely. Because if you don't hear the clarity that's inside you, if you don't quiet the noise and tune in to hear, if your instincts, if your wisdom, if your knowing, if inside of you, you hear yourself saying, I got to get a new job. I got to get out of this relationship. I don't want to live where I live anymore. I want to be near the water. I want to be in the mountains. I want to be out of the city. I, you have to tune into that stuff. And then it's about confidence and courage to take action. That's it. In this video, I'm going to show you the specific way that you can use the five second rule to stop doubting yourself and worrying so much. Now, a lot of people will tell you, oh, just think positive or meh, try not to worry. It sounds simple, but it's not easy. And the reason why it's not easy is because it doesn't work. And actually research shows that when you try to ignore your worries, it can actually make them worse. Look, I understand this topic more than most people because I struggled for decades, not only with worrying and self-doubt, I actually suffered from anxiety and panic attacks for almost 25 years. And in fact, I took Zoloft for two decades to control my anxiety. Using the five second rule, I've not only been able to stop worrying and doubting myself, I've cured myself of anxiety and I've been off meds for more than four years. I'm panic attack free and I almost never ever worrying about anything. And you can teach yourself to do the exact same thing using the rule. First, Here's what I want you to know. You're not a worrier. A lot of us call ourselves a worrier, right? Oh, I'm a worrier. You're not a worrier. You have a habit of worrying. That's a very big difference. You've allowed your mind to drift and linger on negative thoughts so many times. It's now a pattern of behavior that you repeat and you don't even realize it. And that's actually good news because that means that you and I can use the science of habits to break the habit of worrying and the habit of doubting yourself. In the language of habit research, the five second rule is what psychologists call a starting ritual. It's, it's a tool that you can use that will interrupt the negative thought patterns that are encoded in your brain as habits and trigger positive new thought and behavior patterns. The five second rule is shockingly effective because it works with all the latest research about habits. What I've learned using the five second rule is that I do in fact have control over what I think. And when you use the five second rule, you'll discover that you do too. Here's how you're gonna use the rule. The moment, the moment that you feel your thoughts drift, and have you ever noticed how worrying and self-doubt, they have a way of literally like taking you away from a situation. You can feel your mind go from the present moment to drifting to something negative. Maybe you're sitting at a meeting at work and uh, suddenly you start talking down at yourself and doubting yourself. It happens like that. But the moment that you catch yourself do it, that's a moment of tremendous power. You have a decision to make. You can either sit there and listen to the worry and listen to the self-doubt and let it hijack you, or you can make a decision to assert control. That's when you use the rule. You're gonna use the countdown trick, five, four, three, two, one. It's essential. Counting backwards interrupts the negative thought pattern. It's also going to awaken your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that you need to override a bad habit and replace your bad habit with a positive new one. So every time you feel your thoughts drift to something negative, 
or you find yourself worrying about things you can't control, five, four, three, two, one, it'll switch the gears in your brain, it'll interrupt the negative thought pattern, it'll activate your prefrontal cortex, and you've just created a starting ritual that will prime your mind to accept a more positive thought. That is how you use the rule to change. Some days you might use the rule 20 times to interrupt your habit of worrying and doubting yourself. I'm not only, only going to prove to you that a human being can change, I'm going to give you a couple simple things that you can do if you really have something that you want to change, whether it's changing your personality, changing your mindset, changing um, how you show up in the world, changing how you treat yourself, changing your mental health. I profoundly believe that any human being can change. That's what I profoundly believe. Um, I'm here with Christopher Robbins, my husband of 25 years. Um, Chris, do you believe that a human being can change? Yeah, I do. I do. I think that... That's, that's new for you. I'm going to do this. Just look straight ahead. It is a... <laughs> I don't want you to look at the camera. Just look straight ahead. Hi, everybody. I don't know that I necessarily have always not believed you can change, but I'm not sure I've invested as much time and energy of late thinking about the level to which one can change. And of course, that's what's prompted this conversation is just my brother and I thinking about talking about what our childhood was like, what we grew up with, what our dad was like. And he, which was what? He wasn't, um, he had a good sense of humor, but he wasn't real, like, vivacious. And he was not very loving. And, he was caught up in himself. Yeah, he was definitely caught up in himself. And, like, he wasn't a stick in the mud, but he was a little, he was a little down. Okay, hold on a second. I love your dad, and your dad, <laughs> um, uh, had OCD. Definitely. He was way more concerned about the house being in order than hanging out with you guys. And he was way more concerned about what he was working on and his friends than he was about you. Yeah, true. And uh, you have said, you have used the words emotionally neglected. Yes. That your emotional needs were not met by your dad. And in your father's defense, in, in everybody's parents' defense, most of our parents did not have their own emotional needs met by your grandparents, so they have no idea what they're doing. And that doesn't make it right that you didn't have your needs met or that you were abused or that you were neglected or abandoned or whatever. But adults and human beings just repeat patterns of behavior that are modeled for them. And I think it's really important to put a stake in the ground and say, I. 1,100% believe you can change, every human being can change, and you could be the one that actually breaks the patterns that have been handed down from generation after generation after generation in your family. So you have an opportunity to not only reclaim or claim your life as your own and claim your personality as your own and claim your future as your own, you also have the opportunity to break generational patterns of trauma and behavior and parenting styles and uh, all of that stuff, addiction, based on conscious and deliberate choices, decision making, and most importantly, personal development, right? How, how important do you think it is, like to what depth do you need to go to understand the patterns of behaviors that you were exposed to or modeled to in order to, like first and foremost, how important is that before you then elect to make the changes that you... I don't understand your question. Meaning, like, how much how much do you study your own mother or father for I don't example? think you need to study them you at don't? all. At all? No! No! So do you guys realize that you're always changing? That every cell in your body is brand new over the course of seven years? 
that you can change the neural pathways in your brain in real time. You can change the filter in your mind in real time. You can, through practice, you can practice new behaviors and new responses to triggers. And this is so revolutionary. It's incredible. What if your environment is toxic? That's an excellent question. So if your environment is toxic, you need to do a couple things. I mean, it's super simple for people to go, you should just leave your environment. But if you're a minor and you're living in a toxic household, you might not be able to. If you need money and you're in a toxic work environment and you can't just quit because you're well, going to be able to pay your bills. Well, that's Half the time, you don't even necessarily Okay, well, I read about this in my new book. Well, hold on a second. Hold on toxic. a second. Hold on. Yes, you do know you're in a toxic. You want to know how you know? Oh, look at this car, guys. Hi. Look at him. Isn't that kind of cool? Um, you want to know how you're in a toxic environment or relationship? It's very simple. Would you high-five the person or boss that you work for? Authentically, would you high five them? Not high five them in the hopes that they like you, but would you high five the relationship or the job that you're in because you love it and you believe in it and you want to celebrate it? If the answer is no, you've got basically got a couple choices. You can either change how you show up and hope it changes the dynamic, or you can make requests about what's not working and hope the person is motivated to change or you can get the f out like that's it those are your three choices right there there's no other choices so we got a cool question on twitter from langley in nigeria and it has to do with something that we've been hearing from a lot of you about and that is imposter syndrome particularly for those of you that are running a small business or those of you that have a side hustle that you're trying to turn into your full-time thing imposter syndrome is very real let's deal with it right now langley writes from nigeria i'm passionate about film and cinema mel I tweet and I blog about it. People are inspired by what I write. But when I'm offered certain opportunities, I clench up and suddenly feel like an imposter who will mess up and be found. I'm 36, I'm single, in a paycheck to paycheck situation and feel like I have wasted many years due to overthinking, self-doubt, and never feeling good enough or ready. How can I overcome this? Well, you can't. You can't overcome the feelings that are rising up, Langley, but you can take action despite them. That's a very important distinction that I want each and every one of you to understand. The things that you're feeling, clenching up, feeling like you're not good enough, feeling like you're not ready, doubting yourself, kind of spending too much time thinking about how much time you've wasted, all that, that's normal that we all do. You cannot overcome those thoughts because they keep rising up and they've become a habit and it's sort of a pattern. So I don't want you to focus on the thoughts. I want you to focus on taking action. Even though you doubt yourself, you are gonna feel like an imposter until you push through that clenched up moment over and over and over again. And then suddenly through action Langley, you're gonna see that you're not an imposter at all. You're actually the kind of person that pushes through and does what he or she says they are going to do. See, imposter syndrome grows and sticks around when you listen to it and when you keep thinking and when you freeze. The moment you take action, even though you feel like an imposter, you actually explode the syndrome. You kill it. You break it apart because you're not acting like an imposter. You're proving to yourself through the action, that you know what you're doing. Now look, the feelings are gonna take a while to catch up. The first 16 jobs that you do, where you feel nervous, those nerves are gonna be there with you the entire time. Feeling nervous is normal, letting it stop you is a choice. I say this stuff all the time because this is what you're struggling with. If you suffer from imposter syndrome, it's not an issue of whether or not you have the skill. The problem is that you have a pattern of thinking in a way that stops you the moment you start to doubt yourself. If you wanna be successful in business, if you truly want that side hustle to turn into your full-time thing, you have to learn how to let the feelings of doubt rise up 
but take action anyway. You've got to learn to embrace the fact that you're gonna feel like an imposter, but you, my friend, are the kind of person that moves forward anyway. You're passionate about film and cinema. Awesome. Keep tweeting, keep blogging. When people write to you, when they hire you and you get that clenched up feeling, that's a great sign. It means you're about to do something really cool. That's when you're going to just recognize the feeling. Five, four, three, two, one. Take action like the rock star film and cinema guy that you are. I hope that that helps. But the only thing that's gonna help you with imposter syndrome is for you to not listen to it and take action anyway. The barrier is everybody gives a shit mm -hmm. what other people are thinking. Yeah. And so they're on camera or they're on a microphone trying to be smart or concerned about whether or not they look good in the shot, uh, concerned about uh, how they sound, whether or not they stuttered, if their neck is turning red, <laughs> like whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And they're so up here that they're not actually being true to just saying what's right here. Absolutely. Whether you're speaking from the heart, speaking from the gut, like that is the skill to develop, is the ability to be more like an 11 year old <laughs> that gets on camera and can just be themselves instead of being a 49 year old person censoring themselves. Got it. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the truth, when I talk about authenticity, that people really want to feel that connection. Mm -hmm. And the only way that they're going to feel that connection is if you do the work to remove the own veneer and the own barriers that you put in between you and other people. And the number one thing is everybody gives too much of a shit about what everybody else thinks. Absolutely. And you know who they think the mo they're the worried the most about? Their friends. Yeah. If I put this thing up, not for my friends, but for the people that I'm trying to build a rapport with online, my friends are gonna judge me. F your friends, seriously. If you're out to make a difference, if you're out to share something that is important to you, if your friends don't like it or don't support you, they're really not your friends. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And it's a really hard lesson. It's a very hard lesson because everybody's always judging everybody else. That's yeah. why you can't worry about it. Do you have like recommendations for how people just get started like from moving from that, like to basically move from their mindset of I care too much to I don't care as much? Like, are there steps that you recommend people the take? The only to step start? that really works is action. Okay. Because if you're stopping to think yeah. about what people are thinking or whether or not you're worried about what people are thinking, you've already fallen into the trap. The second that you push yourself to get started mm -hmm. through the action itself, you are proving to yourself that even though you care what everybody thinks, you're going to do it anyway. Okay. And Absolutely. so that's why I talk about the five second rule. The yeah. five second rule is how you interrupt the excuses, the patterns, the concerns, and the fears that you have, whether it's perfectionism, mm -hmm. whether it's disappointing your parents, whether it's being judged by your friends, whether it's looking stupid, when you post something, whether it's screwing up and saying something that a bunch of trolls come after you for, right? All yeah. those things that everybody's concerned about, that can stop you forever. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you go five, four, three, two, one, you break the part of the brain where all of those trappings are, okay. and you awaken your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that you're using when you're creating content, when you're speaking with courage, when you're learning something new. And so that's, why this simple brain trick that I invented is exploding around the world. Because every last one of us is exactly the same. Exactly the same. You and I, mm -hmm. we want the same thing. We want to actually live a life where we get to express ourselves Absolutely. at the highest level. Mm -hmm. We all want the, the same thing. And we're all stopping ourselves the same way. No. By thinking too much. By buying into the lies that self-doubt tells you. And so I'm here to tell you, you can cut that off at the knees. Five, four, three, two, one, you can make a five second decision. The second you feel that doubt, the second you feel that concern, the second you feel that, for, that fear. And you can literally feel it and actually move anyway. There was this one morning where um, I walked into the bathroom and I was standing in my underwear, brushing my teeth in front of the mirror. And I looked up at the mirror and my first thought was, Ugh. I noticed that my jowls were starting to look like saddlebags on a pack horse at the Grand Canyon. 
And uh, I had like these crazy lines by my eyes and my neck was really like kind of saggy and one boob was hanging lower than the other and my gray hair was coming in. And I, and as soon as I started kind of critiquing my thoughts or my, my looks and appearance, then my mind rich started going, fuck, I didn't get that email back to that person. And I got that presentation I need to do. And my God, did that speech just cancel again? What the f am I going to do? And I look down and the dog needs to be walked. And then I think I, I got a zoom call in nine minutes. Like I got to get my shit. Again. And before I knew it, my whole mood was low. I felt overwhelmed. I had taken myself down mentally. I just wanted somebody to walk in and be like, Mel, you got, it's gonna be okay. Like you got this girl, like mm -hmm. it's lift your head up. You can handle this. I don't know what came over me, Rich. This is pathetic. But standing there in my underwear in front of my bathroom sink, I raised my hand and high five my reflection. And I cracked a smile because it's so fucking corny. I even thought of that guy, Stuart Smiley from the SNL skit. Mm -hmm. so remember that I'm nice, I'm kind, yeah. people like me. Went on with my day. That was it. Snapped a photo though. No, not that one. Oh, not that one. Mm -mm. Not the first time. And then I kept doing it. I did it probably for a week or two. And here's the weird thing about it. I started when I woke up after doing this high five your own reflection in the mirror thing, I actually started to feel like I was looking forward to it. And here's why. You know, I've spent a lifetime just like you standing in front of the mirror. And what I realize now is that when I'm standing in front of a mirror, I'm either critiquing mm -hmm. or picking myself apart or I'm ignoring myself. And when you start to high five your own reflection, it starts to build a partnership within you with yourself. When you walk into the bathroom and you see your reflection and you've been greeting it, it's like seeing another person. It's the strangest thing. You start to realize how often you fucking ignore or destroy yourself when you see yourself or beat yourself up. And here's what's also crazy. You have a lifetime positive association with high-fiving other people. Mm -hmm. Sure. As a runner, as a racer, you have gotten so many high fives, Rich. What does a high five say to you when somebody gives you one? You feel seen, you feel appreciated, you feel energized by it. And it's, a, it's an exchange of energy. It's not the same, and you talk about this in the book, it's not the same as like self-talk because there's a participation involved in it. There's like a communion yes. aspect to it. Yeah. And you know, if you think about it, you're so good at celebrating, seeing, and cheering for other people in your life. You plan birthday parties, you reach out to people when you're worried about them, you help out colleagues, you cheer for your favorite sports teams, you high five people like Rich as they're running races past you, you buy people's merchandise, you do all kinds of stuff for other people, but nobody's taught you how to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. In fact, the reason why it feels fucking weird to high five your own reflection is because you've been taught to do the opposite. Why is the default to just beat ourselves down like that? I mean, it is crazy. We would never treat anyone else in our lives, especially the people we care about, the way that we treat ourselves in terms of the self-talk or the narrative or the critique or the, you know, the, the, the kind of harshness with which we, you know, judge our appearances, our behavior the way we you know, think back on things that we said the other day and just are horrified by our own selves. And it's, I don't know if it's everybody, but everybody. it's most people. Except for Buddhists. I mean, I yeah. think that they're like, like if you're a big practicing Buddhist, that's a monk. Right. That's like just Why kind can't of, the default be the good things though? Well, you I- know, Why yeah, is it wired that way? You know why? Way? There's, a, there's cognitive bias. There's a, there's a bias towards mm -hmm. negativity. Uh, and it's a protection mechanism that's a default from evolution, that if you remember the bad sh you're more likely to spot it when it happens in right. the future. So you can avoid it. And here's where I think it begins. I believe my theory is that it begins two places. Either you, or that could be both actually, you either learned the pattern of beating yourself up because you had parents or caregivers that were hard on themselves or hard on you. And so as a child, you absorbed that pattern and you now repeat it and you don't even realize it. So those moments you're like, oh my God, I sound just like my dad or my mom. 
that is an example of a pattern that you've absorbed. Mm -hmm. So particularly for women, we've watched our mothers be critical about their appearance. We've watched our mothers ignore and criticize themselves in the mirror. And so we learn that from our caregivers. So that's one place. The second place that we learn it is when the drive in your life becomes fitting in. Fitting into groups in elementary, middle, high school, college, your neighborhood, that feels safe when you fit in. When you feel like you don't belong, you immediately go into a protection mechanism. And I believe a lot of the negative self-talk is a sorting hat type of mentality yeah. that we do to ourselves going, I can't be with those people. I can't be with those people. It's safe to be with those people. And you start to see yourself and the world around you as places where you belong and places where you don't. And part of the criticism, as fucked up as it sounds, that we engage in all the time is don't be too big, don't be too loud, don't show yourself too much, don't have blue hair, don't do this, other people won't like you. It starts as a way to protect yourself from mm -hmm. being rejected, but the truth is you develop a habit of fucking rejecting yourself. Right. Meanwhile, you're further divorcing yourself from who you truly are because you're Correct. not giving yourself permission to be yourself. That gets sublimated in favor of fitting in and, you know, accommodating other people and acclimating your behavior around what will be approved of. Yes. So for me, um, I, you know, I have clearly a lifetime of beating myself up and tearing myself down and regretting decisions that I made. And in the middle of stumbling through life, instead of being like, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, being like, you're really fucked up now, Mel. How does that help? Right. How does criticizing and, and being hard on yourself help? I believe with all of my heart and being that every man, woman, child, person, grandparent, everybody should infuse their days with habits of celebration and self-confidence. And the fastest and easiest and most science-backed way to quickly start to change how you see yourself is by adopting a simple habit of high-fiving your reflection in the mirror every single morning. Now, I know exactly what you're thinking. Are you serious, Mel Robbins? That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I know, I know, I know it sounds dumb. But the reason why your first instinct when you think about waking up, whether you're in your robe or your underwear, or your PJs or your birthday suit and walking into that bathroom and having a moment with yourself and raising your hand and high-fiving yourself is because your self-confidence is in the gutter. You believe some garbage about yourself. You think you're a bad person or you're unworthy or you're ugly or nobody likes you. Or how about this one? This was the story of my life. I have f***ed up my life so badly I might as well just flush it down the toilet. You have some narrative in your mind that is so negative that when you look in the mirror, you see somebody worth trashing. You see what's wrong. You pick apart your appearance. And I want to reverse that because here's the deal about self-confidence. Self-confidence begins with you. You realize the word self is in there, right? I can't give you confidence. I can give you a little boost. I can give you tools, I can encourage you, but confidence is forged in fire. It's something that's within you. And here's the thing I want you to realize about confidence. You are a confident person. That's why you miss feeling that way. You can only miss what you know. You've just been blocked from the feeling of it. And wherever you are right now in your life, I'm telling you, confidence is in there. You just got to figure out how to tap into it. And you've been building confidence all along, by the way. Every time that you have fallen on your face or you've tried something and failed or you've gone out and thought you found the love of your life and then your heart's broken and then you pick yourself up again and then you dust yourself, you're building confidence the entire time because confidence is not built on the high days. Confidence is built on the low ones. Confidence is built when you are struggling. Because when you see yourself go for something and fall, when you see yourself try and get knocked down, when you see yourself stand back up after getting abused or traumatized or discriminated against and moving ahead, you are building 
this reserve within yourself where you know you can rely on yourself, you know you can face hard things and you can keep moving forward. You know you have your own back. So it's in there. Your life has been helping you build it. Now you got to just dig in and tap into it and use it to shut that critic up in your head. So the way you're going to do that is every morning, I'm not kidding, you're going to raise your hand in the mirror and high five yourself. Look at how many people are doing this. You're not the only one. For five mornings in a row, I want you to high five yourself. And when you do this, I want you to use the hashtag high five challenge. You know what's happening when you raise your hand up in the mirror? You are taking the lifetime positive association that you have with cheering for other people, believing in other people, uh, celebrating other people, saying let's go to other people. And you are marrying that positive association with your reflection. It is impossible to raise your hand in the mirror and go, I suck. You can't do it because your brain and the subconscious sees this and thinks, let's go. I love you. I believe in you. And when you do this every single morning, something incredible happens. First of all, you're not going to leave your bathroom feeling like you're dragging a boulder. You're going to leave there feeling like the wind's at your back. Secondly, you're going to have spent the morning, the first thing in the morning by taking a moment and being with yourself. And not seeing your face and picking yourself apart, but actually seeing the person that's underneath the skin, the soul that's behind the face. You are going to shut the critic up. You're going to silence your to-do list. And when you raise your hand like this, it also prompts you to think about the game you're playing. So now you got a moment to be like, oh yeah, yay me. I'm still here. I can make today a good day. In fact, what game do I want to play today? Just for me. So that's the first thing that you're going to do. You're gonna high five yourself, take the high five challenge, which is high five yourself five days in a row in the mirror, take a photo of it, post it on your story, tag me so I can cheer for you and start to notice what happens. Something weird happens by day four, when you get out of bed, you're gonna have this weird feeling that you've never had. You're gonna feel like you're looking forward to seeing yourself in the mirror because something weird happens when you start to really be present with yourself. When you normally walk in the bathroom and you ignore yourself, you're alone. And I think a lot of us feel like we're alone in our lives. When you start to see yourself, you literally, oh, hey, hi there, Mel Robbins, how you doing? You now, as you look forward, oh, hey girl, how you doing? Hi, Mel Robbins. Oh, hey, let's go. I believe in you. Gonna have a great day. It's almost like when your neighbor waves to you, you're seeing yourself. You know, now that I've been doing this for a year, I don't feel like I'm alone. I feel like I've got myself and I've got my own back. I feel like this person that I see in the mirror is the one person that's gonna be with me for my entire life. So I better cheer for her. I better celebrate her. I better encourage her and love her. And that's what you're doing when you do this every morning to yourself. And there are mornings where I stand in my underwear at my bathroom sink and even I don't have a word to say to myself. But I can always do this. And it always lifts my mood. And it is creating that deep connection within me to myself. And that's what builds your confidence. Confidence is being comfortable in your own skin. Confidence is knowing that you have your own back. Confidence is knowing that you can face something. Confidence is believing in your ability to face or survive or try something and be better. And confidence is being willing to try. And all of those things happen when you raise your hand every single morning. The second thing that you should do is um, you gotta be honest with yourself. If there are things about your appearance that are within your control, whether it is the shape that you're in, whether it's the health choices that you're making, whether it's how you take care of yourself in terms of self-love, and you're not taking action in those areas, the lack of action says to your brain, you don't care about yourself. And so what I want you to do is pick one thing, one behavior that you could do every day, the high five's one of them, pick another one, and I want you to practice doing it. And it's a behavior. If you think about the person that you want to become, what's that person do every day that you don't do right now? And when you start to do the thing that the person you want to become is doing, 
you leverage something called behavioral activation therapy. And that is a whole body of research that says when you act like the person you want to become, it's the most powerful way to change a habit. It's even uh, better therapy than uh, talk therapy because the action proves to your brain that you're becoming that person. You're seeing the change through the action. And so then the brain catches up and starts to relate to you like a person that's confident or a person who adores their appearance or a person that celebrates themselves exactly as they are. So try those two things. Make sure you tag me online when you do the high five challenge. And uh, I know it's going to work. The question is, how do you deal with the anxiety that comes from waking up and being on a roll and realizing that when you're making things happen, it's easy to look back and realize how much of your life you wasted. And that makes you present to how potentially little time you have left and how much there is to do in the little time that you have. I can so relate to this, so relate to this. The, the few things I wanna say about this is that I don't think that our experience of feeling anxiety about getting it all done before your life is over, getting it all done in the time that you have, I don't think it's unique. I think that that is something that starts to happen when you feel like your life is on a roll and you're not present to misery, but you're actually present to power and joy and all the cool possible things that you could do. Does the anxiety or how do you make the anxiety go away? I don't think you can. I think that that is a very normal thing to feel when you're a big thinker and you become present to the fact that when you put in the work and when you focus, you really are capable of creating just about whatever you want in your life. And that's both empowering and daunting and terrifying as hell. And so you can't get away from that anxiety, but you can respond to the trigger. I often feel what you're talking about when I'm on an airplane. And maybe it's because I'm really vul I feel very vulnerable and out of control when I get on a plane and I click the buckle and I realize this puppy could go down. And then I think about, okay, I spent 49 years here. There's so much more I wanted to do. So I can relate to this. So there's two things to this. One is being present to time passing and the fact that we're all gonna die and that your life is a gift. When you get present to that, that's the biggest motivator on the planet. And when you feel one of those moments, what I do is I shrink it down and I try to find something in this moment that I'm incredibly grateful for so that if it were to end, right now, then all would be well. I think about the sunset I'm looking at. I find a picture of my kids and my husband. I think about you know the lives that have been touched by the five second rule. And that gratitude in the moment allows my mind to not go psycho thinking about the big vastness around life and those big topics. So that calms me down immediately. That's number one. Number two, I think a slightly different question than um, it's probably anxiety, but I think it has more to do with momentum and how when you start to get unstuck and you start to see things happening, you'll notice that things feel like they start moving faster. As if you are on a treadmill and somebody has secretly come up and turned it up on you. And there are days where we're moving through our day like this morning was one of them. We're getting ready for this live training and all of a sudden I caught myself almost about ready to hyperventilate because I wasn't present to this. I was present to what happens when we have a thousand people show up and where are we gonna hold? <laughs> you know, you kind of speed it up on yourself. So when that happens, I know that I'm in the future, five, four, three, two, one. I need to be right here and right now. And that when you start having big things happen and when you start feeling unstuck and when things start moving, the momentum, you know, because an object in motion tends to stay in motion, your anxiety will make it roll faster. That will not make you effective. You have to slow it down immediately. Just in the case of getting overwhelmed by the big themes in life, when you start to feel like things are <gasps> going too fast, oh my God, oh my God, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough time. No, yes, you do. Slow it down, okay? You know, I'm always looking for new ways to explain the power of the five second rule and the power of five second decisions. And I read something that Tim Ferriss said that really resonated with me. And he 
had this one line buried in a podcast somewhere that just jumped out and it's, it's, it's stuck. And what he said is he said something about how there's a gap between the world and the things that trigger you and your response. And your entire life is that gap. When you start to, this is not what he said, he I kind of identified this gap and I, of course, intrinsically was like, well, absolutely, that's the five second window between instinct or stimulus and your reaction. And when you start to understand that your whole life plays out in this five second gap and that there's a gap that's five seconds long between fear and courage, and there's a gap that's five seconds long between self-doubt and confidence. That is your life. And what's super cool about understanding that your whole life is inside this gap is it's so small, everybody, that you have the ability to control it. Life's always gonna throw triggers at you, and there will always be all kinds of cool things that inspire you, your wisdom, and you get to choose what happens in that gap. Do you succumb to an excuse, or do you push yourself forward? When you start to speak up in business, you'll be shocked at how you start to speak up in your relationships. When you start to make hard phone calls, whether it's in a selling situation, you'll be surprised at how you'll start to close the gap and have hard conversations in your personal life. And so that gap is everywhere and it's the same everywhere. And when you start to go to work in controlling how you live in that gap between stimulus or idea and your response, that's where the magic is. And that's what you're experiencing. The high five habit is no different, okay? So I find myself uh, last year at a very low moment. I am standing in my bathroom. It's a moment I know every woman can relate to. They're in my underwear. Uh, I'm looking in the mirror. And of course, I am picking myself apart. I'm like, I hate how I'm getting really jowly right here. And I don't like how I've got these like, big lines that are starting. And then I notice, you know, I've got this like indent right here that I don't like. And I don't like these like kind of marks right here that go this way on my neck. Which I've covered them up with foundation. Realize, yeah, like, and like, then, what then what this boob hangs <laughs> lower than the other boob. And, and I'm just picking myself apart because that's what I've been doing for the past four decades. That's what almost all women and even men do it too. This is what I'm finding based on the research of the book. And then as soon as my mind is negative about my appearance, my mind goes negative about my day. Oh, God, I, I forgot to text Lisa back. I uh, need to finish up that report. Oh, my gosh, my first Zoom meeting is a night. Oh, the dog needs to be walked. And now I'm going down the road negative about the day. The whole vibe is, ugh. And I don't know what came over me. But I just literally had nothing to say to myself. I really felt overwhelmed just to average low moment. And I found myself, as pathetic as it sounds, raising my hand and high-fiving my own reflection in the mirror, braless in my underwear. It felt good. I put my shoulders back. I felt a little bit like, okay, I got this. And I went on with my day. The next day, there I am again. And my mind is going negative. And I'm like, nope, high five. And that's what the high five habit is. But this is just the beginning. The, the high five habit book is full of a bazillion tools, but I want to unpack this one mm. because there's so much science here. And for women in particular, this is unbelievable in how it changes you and your relationship with yourself. So first, let's start with a high five. When, like, think about when in your life you have either given or received high fives. What does a high five from someone else or a high five that you're giving to somebody else communicate? Um, you're on the same team. You're like yep. in it together. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's also like I think about it. You like give it to somebody before a big play. We got this. You give it to somebody when their attitude's going down. Come on, keep going. Pick your attitude up. You give it to somebody in celebration. And so a high five communicates support and empowerment and partnership and trust and celebration. And it's so powerful and we're so good at giving all of those things to other people. Like you 
and everybody, especially women, we cheer for our friends, we create birthday parties, we buy people presents, we do work for our colleagues when they're overwhelmed, we help our parents out with whatever. We're so good at cheering for our favorite musicians and buying people stuff. Mm -hmm. We are horrendous at giving that same support and celebration to ourselves. In fact, we not only don't give ourselves support and celebration, we do the opposite. We tear ourselves down and we beat ourselves up and we pick ourselves apart. And every single woman I know is constantly saying, how the fuck do I put myself first? How do I do, how do I love myself? I know I'm supposed to. Well, I'll tell you how you do it. You put yourself first by doing for yourself what you've been doing for everybody else because that's how everybody else became first in your life. You need to start to cheer for, support, and validate yourself, period. I realize now that I'm high-fiving myself that I have spent the first 40 years of my life either criticizing my reflection or ignoring it. How sad is that? It's incredibly heartbreaking and yet ex extremely familiar to me. Yeah. And I think a lot of women. Yeah. And believe it or not, a lot of men. Mm. There's a lot of men that don't want to look themselves in the eye in a mirror and be with themselves because they're so focused on the things that they haven't achieved or the things that they failed at. And so they're ignoring themselves. Mm. They're not being with themselves. Mm. And so first things first, when you take a moment in the morning to just stand in front of the mirror and be with yourself, and then you raise your hand in a gesture that you have always associated with celebration, support, belief, and empowerment with other people, there's a number of things that happen that um, can be proven by research. First things first, uh, this is research out of Harvard. It's recent. Uh, they've shown in studies that simply taking a minute in the morning to get intentional about who you're going to be today and how you're going to show up changes your productivity, it changes your level of confidence, it changes how impactful you are as a leader at work and in life. So this moment in the mirror is not to be diminished. This is a moment for you to be able to take a moment and intentionally align yourself with who you're going to be. Second piece of research is from a field of study called neurobics. It basically means when you marry a physical action with something, a thought that's unexpected, you accelerate the development of new neural pathways. Mm. And there's famous studies that have proven that if you brush with like your non-dominant hand while you're thinking something, yeah. it sticks in your mind because you have to focus. Well, the same is true when you raise your hand and high five your own reflection. You see, you've been doing this for your entire lifetime. So there's already subconscious programming here, Lisa. The second that you raise your hand like this, it is so programmed in your mind to associate belief, cheering, empowerment, celebration, you know, with the high five itself, that it's impossible to go, God, I hate my neck. Mm. Boy, is that cellulite ugly. You can't do it because this part of the mind immediately takes over and does all the positive stuff with a high five. It's crazy. Try it tomorrow morning. You will not be able to criticize yourself. Now there's another piece of research around this, which is, you know, when you do a high five, we did one the first one we did, right? right? We didn't quite hit each other <laughs> in the right, like good smack. So what did we do? We did it. Correct because a good high five requires you to be present oh. and intentional. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That All of that in a little me. high five. Mm. And so what I started to notice was that I was in real time shifting my relationship to myself. Instead of criticizing the woman I saw in the mirror or ignoring her, I was developing a partnership, a trust, a sense of self-validation, a, I have my own back. I see you, Mel Robbins. We're going to have a great day today. We got this. No matter what it is that life is going to throw at us, you got this. That's how it all started. And then, of course, I put it on my story after a couple weeks of doing it, and people around the world started to post them pictures of themselves doing it, and then all of their stories started rolling in about the difference that it was making. There was one woman that said that, 
She's been struggling with dysmor body dysmorphia for 20 years. Cannot look in the mirror. And after five days of doing this, can stare at herself in the eyes with a grin. Five days. Five days. And the reason why is because of the lifetime association mm. that you have with doing this for other people. So when you try this tomorrow, here's what I want um, you to do. Stand in front of your bathroom mirror and take a moment and just be with yourself for a second. And then if there's resistance to raising your hand and high-fiving your own reflection, what is that resistance? Disappointment is something that I think every single human being on the planet is feeling right now. Are you feeling a level of sadness and anger and frustration and fear? That mix is disappointment. Disappointment is a very complicated emotion. And there is a lot that people are disappointed about right now. Here in the United States, uh, tomorrow is opening day, or it was supposed to be opening day of baseball season. We should be in the middle of March Madness, the huge basketball tournament. And I think collectively what we're in the middle of instead is something called March Sadness. The Olympics just got pushed off. Weddings are getting pushed off. High school graduations are getting canceled. Bar mitzvahs are getting canceled. Summer trips are getting canceled. My brother just, uh, I was on the phone with my brother the other night and he told me that they have canceled their trip in July to go float the Grand Canyon. And my daughter, I was just talking to my daughter and she was explaining that so many of her friends are starting to get their summer internships canceled. And I wanna talk about disappointment because disappointment is what you feel when something that you expected to happen didn't happen. And I wanna start us off with a quote from Anne Lamont. Expectation is resentment waiting to happen. I'm gonna say that again. Expectation is resentment waiting to happen. And I know that there are so many expectations that you had about what you would be doing right now. What would you be doing this week? What you would be doing this month? That's not happening because of this global pandemic. And so what I want you to do is I want you to take a moment. There's one right there. I can't see my new grandbaby twins who were born yesterday. Funerals are getting canceled in Spain. Um, I want you to write down in the comments, what is it that you're disappointed that is not happening right now? What are you disappointed about in terms of how this pandemic is impacting your life? What are you disappointed about because something got canceled? We can't go outside is what somebody's saying. Um, funerals are getting postponed. You know, we just had somebody that used to work on the Mel Robbins show lose a family member to the virus. And first of all, I just want to send a huge amount of love to this person. Um, and I would imagine that maybe they're not going to be able to have a funeral in the traditional sense. And that must be tremendously disappointing. I see canceled travel plans. I see that I can't spend time with my new fiance. I see disappointed in families' decisions in this time on those of you in Facebook. Uh, what are we seeing on LinkedIn? Uh, those of you watching on Twitter, you can go ahead and tweet to this response. If you're on YouTube, put it on the comments. My son might not graduate. I'm shooting a very important wedding in my career that's been canceled. I can't leave the U.S. due to immigration paperwork. We know uh, based on uh, our family connection that there's a family here uh, near us who has a family member who cannot get back from Peru right now. She is away on a year study abroad. She is stuck with about 250 other uh, US citizens in Peru trying to get home. And I want you to talk about this disappointment and what you're feeling because the thing about disappointment, I'm gonna say it again, is it's an expectation, right? That's not happening. And when you have expectations that aren't met, it's a resentment that's waiting to happen. And so I bet if you have family members that are acting out, I guarantee you it's because they have not processed disappointment right now. They have not even 
allowed themselves to go there. And there's so much triggering stuff right now, you know, whether it's spring sports. I mean, think about what an outlet spring sports are for people, whether it's something that you watch together as a family or it's something that you do as a family. Spring break, commencements coming up, Easter services. You know, we are going through a moment that none of us have ever experienced before. So nobody knows what the hell they're doing, right? We're just doing the best that we can. And so I think that we got to talk about the disappointment that, that you're feeling and you got to give yourself permission to feel it. Because if you don't own what you're feeling and if you don't give yourself the space to move through it, it's going to eat you alive and it's going to cause you to act out. For me, when I get disappointed, I get sad and angry. That's what I feel. I get short with my family members. And I do this thing, and I don't know if you've done this thing where, you know, if you're watching this live stream, I'm going to assume that you're safe. If you're watching this live stream, and I see all this stuff you guys are, are disappointed by, I can't pay the rent. You know, I, I can't do what I want to do. I can't see my parents. I can't go outside. I see all these things that you're disappointed by. And... I can't, Michelle on Facebook, I can't go to, what was it, Mandy? My daughter's graduation. I just saw somebody say, I'm disappointed that my husband can't be in the delivery room with me because of new protocols based on the coronavirus. And so I want you to write down, what are you disappointed by right now? What are you present to? And I'm gonna talk about why this is such a complex emotion and then I'm gonna give you some very simple steps to help you name it because you should not fix the disappointment. You should feel the disappointment. That's critical. Did you hear what I just said? You should not try to fix this disappointment. You should feel it first because feeling it and naming it and really letting yourself mourn something that you're disappointed that you're not gonna be able to do, that's how we start to have it lessen its grip on you. And I want to share something really personal that happened to me this morning. Um, I was in the kitchen. Wait, let me see if my daughter. Soy, would you come in here? Do you mind? She's been exercising. She's going to kill me. I'm going to see if she'll come in because it happened with our oldest daughter today. Um, I was in the kitchen and uh we were talking and you don't need to jump on just yet if you want to or come over here and kind of hang with me it's literally little this is my our oldest daughter soy sawyer who's who's disgusting she says and because she's just been exercising if you have a floor in your house you have a home gym um so soy what happened this morning i'm going to talk to them i know it's weird because i'm actually talking to you but i want to explain what happened so i came into the kitchen this morning and um Sawyer was uh, on her phone and you were making breakfast and I don't know how it came up, but you said something about inter. Oh, I know. She asked me if she needed to take a professional photo, right? Remember this conversation, Soy? Yeah. She needed to take a professional photo because she has, she's a rising senior at Boston college. Uh, she's now home taking classes to finish her junior year. And she has a summer internship at a really amazing technology company here in Boston doing marketing. And she said to me this morning, I need to take a professional photo. And I said, what for? And she said, it's for my summer internship. And I said, oh, well, that's great that, you know, thank God that's still happening. And then do you remember what you told me? I just said that a bunch of my friends' internships have been canceled. Yeah, so a bunch of summer jobs have been canceled this summer and that creates a tremendous amount of disappointment. And I know some of your jobs have been canceled. And what happened in that moment is I did exactly what you shouldn't do. I have this thing that I do as a parent and as a person that when I feel slightly anxious, I try to fix everything. Instead of stopping and taking a beat and listening and really getting present to what this person that I love is saying, and I'm gonna to start to cry. 
I turn into like the locomotive and I move forward a hundred miles an hour to try to make everything okay. And I did that with you because what I did, Soy, is I said, oh, well, you know, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I didn't even ask you if you were nervous about your internship getting canceled. I just said, it's going to be okay. And then I went to fix it instead of feel it. I said, you know, if your summer internship gets canceled, uh, I I'll find a job for you. You can, you can work for our company. Uh, I could help you. You can help me with the live streamers. I went to fix it. And I think the reason why I went there is because it's so uncomfortable to feel these deep emotions. It's so uncomfortable to know that people that you love might be scared. It's so uncomfortable to be in the discomfort and the sadness and the anger of this moment. And so I wanted to apologize to you. I so do apologize. <laughs> and I want to know what are you feeling right now? Are you what are you disappointed about, Soy? Um, I'm disappointed that my junior year got cut short right when I got to Boston College. Yep. Um I'm sad that I'm not with any of my friends right now and that it's a lot harder than I thought to take classes online. Um, I'm nervous about this summer and no offense being cooped up in the house. <laughs> um, no offense. I'm, I don't know. I just hope I'm just hoping it all comes to a close sooner rather than later. And is there one thing in particular that you're disappointed about more than something else? Um, I think right when we left, um, school was right when everything was like really ramping up and we had a ton of plans that were already set in stone and then all of them just like got canceled and we were all just like really looking forward to it, but it didn't happen. So, yeah, <laughs> so that's what I'm kind of bummed about, but yeah. And okay. you know, here's something that I learned from Brene Brown that having the perspective, and this is the perspective we all need. First of all, you should not fix your disappointment. You got to first feel it. That's takeaway number one. Okay. Because when you talk about it, when you name what you're feeling, I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling disappointed. It loosens its grip on you and the anger and the acting out, it doesn't bottle up because if you don't own these feelings and if you don't feel these feelings, they will eat you alive. And one of the mistakes that I've made as a parent is first of all, trying to fix everything. Okay major mistake. Second thing I've made a uh, mistake as a parent during this time is I get so frustrated because I'm disappointed and I'm sad and I'm doing the best that I can that I have that moment. Do you remember the movie Moonstruck where she's like, snap out of it, where you want to just yell at somebody and go, come on, you got food, you're safe, you're going to be fine. At least you're going to college and you try to slap perspective into somebody. And you do it because you're frustrated. You do it because you're disappointed. You do it because you're on edge. And perspective is a function of experience. And none of us have ever gone through anything like this before, ever. And she's also only 21. I have a totally different level of perspective at the age of 51, a different level of confidence, knowing that we're going to get through this, knowing that better days are coming, knowing that you know, spring break can get rescheduled, knowing that we're very, very lucky to be in a house and have supplies and have internet access. And so the thing that I noticed about myself too, is that when the kids first came home and they were super angry that spring break got canceled and the Boston Marathon's been canceled, that's the best day on campus, right? And I'm like, oh, for God's sakes, you spoiled entitled kids. The truth is her disappointment over the Boston Marathon getting canceled is real. And based on her perspective and life experience, it does feel like the end of the world. For your eighth grader or your uh, high schooler with baseball season coming up, who was expecting to be recruited or hoping that this was going to be the season, that disappointment is soul crushing for somebody that's only 15, 16, 17 years old because they don't have the perspective 
that you and I have. So it's so important that you understand that this is a collective moment of disappointment, that whatever disappointments you're feeling are real and put your disappointments in the comments right now. I need you to feel it first. We don't fix it first. We feel the disappointment first. Is there anything else that you want to say you're disappointed about? Mm. I can tell you something I'm disappointed about. Sure. So as I look out the window right now, everybody, I see a uh, planter and it is full of ugly, dark, dirty dirt. It looks very depressing. And one of the things you may not know about me is that I am uh, a gardener. I love gardening. My parents are huge gardeners. Um, I learned my love of gardening and my green thumb from my parents. I also have grandparents that are farmers. So me, the earth, getting my hands dirty, playing with flowers, planting things, moving things around. That is like food for my soul. And right now is the time that I would be going to my favorite plant places, local businesses that aren't open right now. And I'd be buying my pansies and I'd be buying my daffodils from my pots and I would be planting my planters for spring. And doing that is not only food for the soul, but it also... Um, makes me feel so connected to my parents who are in Michigan. And I am really disappointed that I can't do that right now. And I am very disappointed that this week I was supposed to be uh, in the panhandle of Florida in the Destin area with my parents just chilling out and I'm not there. And so I am feeling this disappointment and I want you to right now, right in the comments, because we're not going to fix it first. We got to feel it first. Okay, everybody, you're going to write in the comments. What are you disappointed to in this moment? It could be really little. Anything else you want to say, Soy, about disappointment? I'm good. You're good? Yeah. Do you feel better? Yeah, I feel better. You're the best. You're the best too. Love you. I love you too. Um, so... The other thing I want you to do is now that you're naming this disappointment, not having a hug for weeks, not seeing my boyfriend, starting to feel depressed, uh, my husband, I'm, I'm disappointed that my surgery was candled. Yes, I miss 30A as well. I really do. Uh, that graduation was canceled. A lot of things getting canceled. I see that. And here's what I want you to understand. Disappointment is a really complicated emotion because it's a combination of a bunch of things. It's a combination of hurt, of anger, of sadness. And here's the big one, you ready? Loss, loss. You are literally grieving something that you expected to happen. And so I love this. I see everything that you're putting in here. My trip to California to see my best friend, not being able to get my surgery. My Business is suffering. I didn't see parents on my birthday. We see on LinkedIn. We see no Zumba. And, you know, don't laugh because here's the other thing that I, I was making in terms of mistake is I was dismissing my disappointment. I was making myself wrong for being sad that I can't do this thing outside and plant my planters. Do not invalidate yourself. Allow yourself to feel it. Allow yourself to feel it because it's a complicated emotion. And so as you are naming it and stating it, you need to honor it, okay? So here's something that I find to be really helpful. It's very hard to see. If, you're, uh, if you ever watch the Mel Robbins show, you're gonna, you can go to melrobbins.com slash stay connected and you will be able to find a link to what we call a word wheel. And I use this all the time to help me find words that are helpful. Right here in the center are the words that we typically speak in. I'm sad, I'm happy, I'm uh, angry, I'm afraid, uh, I'm surprised. And then when you come out, I'm happy, you go and you get into these deeper, more complicated words. And on the outer edge are words like, I'm disappointed, I am inadequate, I'm inferior, I'm insignificant, I'm helpless, um, I feel out of control, I feel perplexed. 
And finding the exact emotion that you're feeling is super, super, super helpful. Because when you identify that thing that you're feeling and you allow yourself to feel it, which is the hardest thing in the world to do. I mean, I just gave you an example live of how hard it is to stand in discomfort. And that's what disappointment is. It's uncomfortable. It's one of the hardest feelings to stay in because it's a mix of all these other things. Uh, you know, I go to fixing it <clears throat> like you just saw with my daughter because it's uncomfortable to stand with somebody that you love who is feeling sad or feeling disappointed or feeling frightened. And so finding your words using this word wheel can really help you process it faster. So once you've named it and you felt it and you stood in the discomfort, now let's give you a couple simple things to move through it, okay? Here we go. The number one thing that helps you with disappointment, once you name it, once you feel it, once you honor it, is reminding yourself that better days are coming. And here's how you can do that. I have found it extraordinarily helpful to pick a day out in the future. And for me, it's the end of August. I don't care what the experts say right now. I'm just picking the end of August. And I'm picking a day where I am anchoring myself out in the future saying better days are coming. I know that I can be disappointed that all this stuff is happening, but better days are coming. Pick a new date when the better days are coming. And here's a trick that has helped me. I want you to think about something that you would love to do once the uh, pandemic is over, once we have gotten through this together, once we can all go outside, once our doctors and nurses are safe and sound and, and all of this chaos has left us behind, where do you wanna go? What is the thing you most look forward to doing? I'm gonna share mine, then I want you to share yours, okay? So the thing I am most looking forward to doing is I am most looking forward to going back home where I grew up to Western Michigan and going out to the state park at Lake Michigan and walking across those sand dunes and walking across the sand and going out into Lake Michigan and taking a swim. When I can do that, I am now be, this is behind me, the disappointment is behind me and I know that I am in better days. And once you get that visual picture, so let's first describe for me what you're gonna do. My One of my friends, she had a huge trip planned to Disney World. That of course got canceled. And so they are now picking a date out in the future and they are going to plan an epic trip to Disney. And since they have all this time, they're gonna stay in an even better hotel. Uh, I have another friend, I know what Sawyer's is going to be. My daughter who was just in here. The best day of the year, she says, at college is when the Boston Marathon runs. That is happening now in September. So her vision is going to be that those runners are running past Heartbreak Hill, right past Boston College, and she is there with all of her friends. So now that you have, oh, I see this beach vacation we planned for Labor Day. Visit my best friend in Florida. Uh, I'm going to the beach. I can't wait to be floating on the lake, um, sitting on a beach. We got a lot of beach. Any hikers in the mountain? At Colorado trips with my kids. My my brother just canceled a trip to float through the Grand Canyon. Um, so I would imagine that might be his. Patty on Facebook says fishing and gardening. Uh, a vacation in Charleston, South Carolina. Maybe it's going and hanging out with your family. Um, what are our folks on LinkedIn saying? Visiting my best friend in Amsterdam, going to the, oh, Fenway Park, a concert, uh, Hawaii, Sunday dinner with all my family present. Oh, I love these. A better day is coming. Can't you feel it? Because this is temporary. And so is disappointment. Disappointment is temporary if you don't try to fix it. 
if you allow yourself to feel it, if you name the key emotion that you're feeling, if you don't invalidate yourself for feeling it and you just allow yourself to mourn it, and then you remind yourself that it's temporary. Visit my best friends in Positano, Italy. Go shopping without fear. Visiting my friends in Europe. I love this. Dan in, on LinkedIn is gonna take an RV trip. Maybe you're looking forward to just getting back to the office and not having to work remote with your kids and your dog underfoot and seeing your colleagues. Um, you know, I want you to keep writing in. You're doing an amazing job. I see all these things that you are writing about the fact that this is temporary and picking a date, a couple months out, six months out, three months out, whatever empowers you and come up with an image of what you're going to do. You're going to relaunch your business. You're going to rehire employees you had to let go of. You're going to open that restaurant up. You're, what is it that you're going to do? Now, here's the final piece, you ready? And this is the really important one. I need you to find an image. Find an image that represents the Penn State football game that you just wrote about going to. Find an image of the concert you're gonna to go to. Find an image of that mountain you're gonna climb or your business reopened. Find an image, okay? I'm gonna show you mine because I want you to print it out or make it your screensaver. This is an image of the state park that uh, I grew up going to. Walking through the sand dune, heading down to the beach, that's Lake Michigan right there. And this printed out, it sits above my desk. This is what I call a visual anchor. You can also in scientific research terms call this an environmental trigger. An environmental trigger is a good thing when used this way. It triggers you subconsciously to remember what we're talking about, that this moment is temporary and that better days are coming. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're gonna like this one too. I'll see you there.